Good morning, Hedlers. We are here on a beautiful Friday morning. This is your daily huddle with Giovanni Gonzalez and Sorel Ketan, your co-founders of the daily huddle. And uh, we're exploring a phenomenal question this morning how to make effective use of individuality to avoid sabotaging teams and organizational performance. And I'm beginning with a quote from a chapter in a book entitled Uncommon Results. And this quote is from your very own Giovanni Gonzalez and Sir Al Kitan. In the context of individuality, Individuality is your identity. In other words, your answer to the question, who am I? People's unconscious, automatic, and default answer to the question, who am I? Now listen, who are you? Your default answer to that question is, I am my thoughts, my aches and pains, my past, my feelings, my emotions, my opinions. And as such, I exist to defend and protect my existence against any and all external threats, achieve my goals, and meet my personal needs. This is individuality, and we're going to explore how to mine that to propel organizational and personal performance. Hit it. Good morning. Good morning, Giovanni. Welcome. <clears throat> Great to have every single one of you. And let's anchor ourselves in what it is to be a daily huddler. <laughs> a daily huddler is a person who answers five specific questions in a very specific way. So I'll begin with you. Stand the man. Yes, sir, my brother. Where are you and who are you going to hug today? Man, I am right here, right in this place, right here, where I'm supposed to be, man. I'm, I'm right going to hug here. my beautiful wife, man. Okay, let's yeah. do that. Give Doris one for me, too. I sure will. So I got to give her two big hugs. I'll do that. Rashida sitting in the Poconos where it's 32 <laughs> degrees. <laughs> what time is it? And what are you grateful for? The time is now. Now, no, don't mind the weather for me. I am still here right now. And I'm grateful to be with my family daily every morning. Once the universe allows me, I will be here. And I'm grateful to be here. Uh, welcome, Rashida. This is your home. And thank you for claiming it. Thank you for making it yours. I'm going to my dear friend and partner, Giovanni Gonzalez, to ask this question. Gio, how are you? So let me say, uh, let, me, let me check with myself. I am likely the way I say I am. And today I say I am excited i am excited yes i got it joe i'm gonna steal that one from you and uh channel you and i am excited excited to engage in this conversation giovanni so first of all joe thank you for creating this conversation with me when uh we wrote this chapter back in uh, gosh it was 2021 wasn't it yes uh you know i never fathom that this conversation for looking at individuality would have the impact that it's been having on the organizations ourselves included and the people we've been working with 
uh, when it comes to performing in life and in business, uh, I do, you do, human beings have this innate drive to either glorify individual, individual excellence or vilify it. You know, it's, it's one, one extreme or the other. It's either, oh my God, I'm going to put so-and-so on a pedestal because they're so good. Or even though so-and-so is so good, he disgusts me or she disgusts me so much, I'm going to vilify him or her. So individuality lives in the two ends of the spectrum, never to be right here where one or an organization can effectively use it to enhance personal performance and organizational performance. So uh, I wanted to engage in this conversation to assist us and others to distinguish individuality for what it is in the context of our mission to uh, create a new paradigm for being human and the expression of leadership in the world to give people access to that through individuality, as opposed to I'm in business, I now have to either rely on individuality exclusively to perform or hire good people or vilify it and fight it all the way through. So uh, in that context, Giovanni, uh, looking at where mindful performance blueprint is now and where our partnership is and how it's evolved, how would you say we have effectively used individuality to enhance personal and organizational performance? That's a profound question, Sora. I wanted to ask you, I wanted, I want to address what you're pointing to and um, and I wanted to, can I ask you a question first? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then we go into that question. Uh, one of the, what, how would you define, since we're talking about individuality, how would you define what individuality is in a context like, like a 12 year old will get it? Like, what does it mean to be an individual? What does, because I feel like, yeah. I feel that's like it's a great in- question. Yes. So I'd say that's, I'd say that's a great question, right? Yep. So in the context of a five-year-old, I remember being five. <laughs> it, uh, it was a long time ago, but I do. Um, and m- one of my favorite toys, Gio, was the top. A top in Haiti is the It's made out of wood, it's carved, it's got a nail at the end. You wrap a a little string around it and you throw it and it spins. You can pick it up with your hand, let it spin in your hand, do tricks with it, throw it behind your back. Man, that was my toy. Now to be an individual for a five-year-old is to have something that is mine. And when somebody else touches it, guess what? You're in trouble. No, I'm threatened. And and they're in trouble. (laughs) I'm threatened. They're in trouble. You're taking what's mine. Give it back. Yeah. And at at work is something very similar, right? Yeah. You know, that that's an aspect of individuality. The other aspect of individuality is that I'm special. And therefore, if I'm going to be really special, there's a little bit of specialness that you must not have or let go for me to be really special. And when you don't treat me as special, I either get offended, disrespected, uh, left out. You know, there's this aspect of being me that unless I'm separate and special, then I don't matter. That's another aspect of individuality at the level of a five-year-old. I, I want to I want to add something. I and I think that people don't walk around thinking I am special. I think people walk around thinking or saying things this way. I like to do things this way. 
I am committed to do things the right way. I want to make sure that um, everybody can achieve their goals. And there, so there is this, people walk around with this profound commitment to do the right things, right? <laughs> and I, and I like to and I like to combine it with what you're pointing to. That maybe what's in my blind spot is that I'm walking walking in life with I am special chip, masked as I need to do the right thing. I want I need to get the job done, and you need to do it right too with these expectations. That's what yeah. I'm. Yeah, yeah, Jill. It's like I love I love the analogy you bring uh, to the point where I've, I've got this chip on my shoulder called I'm special. And it's not really that I am for myself that I'm special because I remember being five, man. And um, you see the size of my lips right now. My face was twice as small, but my lips were just that big. That was beautiful, man. <laughs> <laughs> and while my face was twice as small and my lips were just that big, my head was also the same size it is now. So picture this image, man. So my, my father and I took this father and son portrait. I mean, he loves me like nobody else does. And if you can picture my father seated, leaning back, handsome like you cannot imagine with his legs crossed and I'm standing behind him with my hand draped across the shoulder. He loved that picture. I hated that picture. Because <laughs> all I could see was the size of my lips and the size of my head with respect to the size of my face and for myself, I was ugly. Mm. So individuality shows up that way. I am a certain way. I'm like an object with physical properties and that who I am depends on these physical properties. So I couldn't wait to grow so my face could catch up to my head and my lips. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, that that's that's a comparison to physical properties. And I think in organizations, Giovanni, when it comes to people performing, uh, there's this aspect of my performance, my competence, my capabilities, my knowledge, my whatever you call it, that makes me worth hiring or make me worth facing a client and contributing something that people relate to just like I related to my face and my lips. Mm -hmm. And they're waiting for something within them to catch up so they can actually be the person who could serve that client or be the person in this organization that could get that promotion and make a real difference. So, and their body shows up that way. I hear something to, to combine that I hear in what you're saying. An aspect of individuality is a concern for myself, a concern for oneself, where I am not enough of what I should be. And then another aspect of being an individual is another concern where I need to prove to others or I need to be recognized by others that I am enough. So there, so there, an aspect of individuality at work and at home is to, for oneself, is to manage those two worlds that are happening all the time. Am I good enough? And so I got to prove myself. And the other aspect is, are you recognizing me that I am enough? So therefore, you've you've got to do the the, the job to make sure that I feel special, that I am recognized. And inside of that soup. Uh, in a company or in an organization, people are constantly waking up, going to work with a concern, with a threat. I'm not enough and you don't think I'm enough. I'm not enough and you don't think I'm enough. And therefore people do extraordinary things to get recognized and extraordinary things 
to destroy what they have built. And I, and I see that in organizations. And so it happens all the time. Uh, we call it the people create a tank for guilting and shaming to prove themselves. Yeah, all in a quest to be for myself an individual that matters. And you and I say that that has a tremendous impact on personal performance and fulfillment in life, and also a tremendous impact on organizational performance. Now, we're not gonna dive into the, the nature and the, the magnitude of the impact, but I think people can see that now, right? That if I'm in a company or in a family or in a relationship, and my sole reason for existence, unbeknownst to me, is for you to validate my specialness so that I can feel like I'm enough. Mm -hmm. Man, that's, uh, that's a vicious cycle that never ends, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, and in a company, also, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, also how, the way people perform, the way the people that you supervise perform, it's also a threat. Because yeah. if people don't perform the way I want them to, then that means something about me. And so then that's more, more of that vicious cycle, right? <laughs> so Sorel, so how, how, how can a person include someone's nature? Because it is a nature. It is how a nature, right? Someone nature to yeah. create my performance. I was having a conversation yesterday and I asked somebody, Gio, and I'm going to ask you the question now. Gio, can you live without skin? I don't know, Sorel. <laughs> Highly unlikely? I don't know. Highly unlikely. Yeah. You could live without hair, but you probably couldn't live without skin. But the idea is the same way that skin is to a human being. Like until I said the word skin, you weren't even conscious that you have it. Mm -hmm. The same way that skin is to a human being is the same way that that nature you're talking about. The nature for me to be an individual protecting my own existence as an individual, using guilt and shame as the protective shield, my need to dominate or avoid domination, to stand out as an individual and to always be looking at life through a filter called something's wrong with me and something's wrong with life out there. Like that's the life of a human being. That's skin. That's like water to the fish. Mm -hmm. So uh, we won't dive into it because it's 18 after. But I'll, I'll point to it and I'll ask you to add to it. Given that it is like skin and water to the fish. For millennia now, human beings have been resisting being human. They have been at work fixing themselves so they can be better human beings. How one can begin to include humanity and make effective use of being an individual is to simply see it for what it is. And what it is, is that that's your nature. Mm -hmm. Don't fight it. Use it as a way to trigger your own awareness. So you know when you're acting as an individual, catch yourself and then choose in that moment. So individuality can be access to choice, the choice of my response, the choice of what I say, the choice of my actions, rather than the automatic reactions that come with the nature of being a human being. Mm -hmm. So individuality so can be access to choice. So a big question to just point to it and, and then hopefully we can leave a good seed yeah. for this conversation is a good question is, all right, so that's my nature. My nature is to um, be an individual and have a concern for myself and how I look to others and how others see me. And um, so how, how can one be empowered by one's individuality? And I think that what we do, I think, and we do it really well, is that an aspect, a very important aspect of individuality is that people within their nature want to connect to something bigger than themselves. And people 
are willing to do a lot. And what I mean by that is people are willing to reinvent themselves. People are willing to reinvent their individuality. People are willing to reinvent what they have been holding on to for years for something bigger than themselves. And when, when a manager, when a leader knows that, right? Or when it's just a human being, when a human being knows that and a human being knows how to connect people with something bigger than their own selves, right? Their own concerns, something bigger, something that uh, impacts others, society, right? When one can connect to something bigger than themselves, genuinely, this concerns for, for oneself, this individual concerns, they're still there because they're my skin, but they are no longer my priority. My priority is how do I make a contribution to others, to something? How do I become better to be a contribution? And I think that what in our line of work, we have seen uh, nothing less than miracles to what people do in their nature to be to fulfill a mission in their lives. And the cool thing about this is that it doesn't have to be this grandiose mission. It's just something that people connect to that matters to them. And what we see is this we see wonderful actions, wonderful performance of people that never saw themselves as a leader. They never saw themselves as high performers. They never saw themselves as Olympic athletes. And then they become, not because of themselves, but because they connect to something bigger than themselves. And I think that's the, the line of work that we do. And we, we, we've seen that. Yeah, uh, time and time again, when people connect to something bigger than themselves, uh, they for themselves become the miracle. And they for themselves as a human being with those properties, disappear in the background and they give themselves the permission to surrender to that which is bigger than themselves and it's just beautiful so yes. let's open it up for questions we've opened up a can of worms why not <laughs> good morning good morning this is rashida listen sorel and jill every friday you are ways come and like what I would say, open a can of worm. <laughs> they are fat and big and long. But it came to me when I'm listening to Sorel talking about his, his, his dad and how small his head, his head and his lip. It's amazing how what it took me back in is how we create our personality or we create and find out what was what is our purpose on this planet and why i say this is that once we know what is our purpose and what we are here to serve our individuality is it's in a cocoon and we just have to live in it and strive with it because in once we strive with it and we live with it, nothing's matter, but people see you for what you are and what you is and what you serving at that moment. And with that, I'm out, but I'm still here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. That was really great. Thank you, Rashida. <laughs> I, 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 get, I get the picture. It's like these worms, they're fat. <laughs> they're long. <laughs> I could see them going. <laughs> oh, I just love you, Rashida. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Hi, this is Florence, and I'm not coming off of um <laughs> I don't want to come off of call on the camera. That's but, okay, um, Florence. But I'm going to say that this is a very interesting topic. Um recently. I um, had a you know uh, an experience uh, while I was in England looking after my sister, and that um, same 
I don't know if you call it dichotomy or whatever, this doubleness, this you small and, you know, and, and how you feel that you're validated and all of that came up. But, um, and it was very traumatic, the, the experience that I had in England. when I came back here, but recently I came to see, I mean, I just want to de describe it. I, how I experienced it is that my ego was, was, was in the way and the ego was like the small child and the small child was really acting up. And, and then now I've come to realize that the, the bigger child, which is me, the human, um, the, the person that I came to be, found its place and realized that it was really the ego that in a way I, I allowed in a moment to take over. Now that I am, you know, back to where I'm supposed to be, now I find I found my power again. Now from my joy again, because as you say, I've connected to that higher, that thing outside myself. But well, that thing outside myself is God. That for me is God. And I've connected again to, to that source, that God. And the purpose for which I came, I am connected again to that purpose. So to me, that's how I experience in the work, because I'm not in an organization or anything now, but this is how I'm experiencing that, those two things, that ego and that real who I am, mm. I am or who I came to be. Mm. Very great. Thank you, Florence. It's really, really great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for creating that. Sorrel, um, there are two questions in the chat. And then I think Lorna, Laura, Laura raised her hand. So you want to address both? And then uh, let's uh, let's take Laura first, and then let's look at the questions in the chat as well. And then we'll close. But Laura yes, is the great. one that created the question in the chat. Laura, but, uh, go ahead. Yes, yes. I put the question when you were talking about worthiness, because yeah. personally, I my word was dependent on people and what others think about me. And when I perform and I get um, acknowledgement and validation that made me feel good. So when I'm not out there performing, I feel, you know, like down, I feel depressed, but that was part of my, um, well, social heredity it was about performing. But I want to just quickly touch on the subject of giving ourselves permission to surrender. And I got this through a hurricane. We had a hurricane in 1987. And we were there pushing against the window when the eye of the storm turned. And we we're there forcing, pushing against the window. And suddenly, suddenly, this is like spirit said, let this go, there is a force that's stronger than you. Mind you, all this time before I was uh, into the communist movement, I was agnostic, you know, I was just going through turmoil at the time. And when that hit me, we, we let the windows go and immediately the wind blew the glass in and flooded the room flooded the house. And that was when I realized, I said, you know what? It's time for me to surrender. But that's been a journey. It's a journey. It's an evolution of my spirituality. But that was when it hit me that really there's this force that's greater than I am. I'm complete. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And then I, I want to say something, Sorel, to address yeah. the, the other question. Yeah, go ahead. Including what Laura said. So what we, what, what I'm going to speak for myself, right? What I have 
found that, what I have discovered is that that force that Laura is pointing to, that force that Florence is pointing to, that force that is within all humans, when I do the intentional work to connect it to a framed mission statement, to a framed purpose in connected that in a, with a with a mission statement with a purpose that is actually described is not in my in my emotions it's not an experience no it's actually stated when i do the work to connect that force with a stated mission whether it's inside of a company or inside of a family and i continually do the work to connect others to that mission statement Continue, what do I mean by that? I continually intentionally do the work to have others read it, have others see it. It triggers that force for everyone who's reading it. And it's a consistent work. It's not like uh, you, you hear it once and then it's, it's over, right? No, it, it's, it's something that people connect to so um, on a regular basis so that when a person is feeling weak, like we do all the time, you can still connect to that force next time they see it again, because people are roller coaster. So anyway, that's what I wanted to add. So as, as the practical that's aspect. just that's just phenomenal, Gio. Uh, you know, I'll stand on your shoulders and say that there there is this point in an organization, in a family, in a group where people create that which you're pointing to, Gio. They create it together by massaging it, by throwing ideas out, and then not really in a sense where they're wordsmithing or making sure that the grammar is correct, but they're really looking for the words that truly express what they're surrendering to. And this kind of magic happened where an entity is born, but the entity that's born isn't a human being. It's that force that is born out of the work that they do together. Giovanni and I love to say that people support what they create. And I'll add to it this morning and say, people surrender to what they create. And it's a beautiful thing when it happens. And it doesn't just happen once. You have the opportunity to create it and invent it over and over again. So in the context of how do I know that my team is really connected I know that my team is connected when I am that they're not. And we're doing the work together to connect again over and over and over. Awesome. Thank you, Sorel. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I love you. Sorel loves you more. And for this weekend, there are eight tenants for you to take on and connect. First and always love. Love is not, it's something that you cannot control, but love controls everything. Love is something you can't influence, but, it, but love influence everything. I heard that this week and I loved it. <laughs> laugh out loud, stretch your cheeks, really laugh at the whole thing. There's only one life, why not? Eat more plant-based, get closer to the trees, hug the trees, eat the trees, let the animals live, let them die whenever they do. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep, <laughs> sleep at least seven hours, really sleep, sleep. If you can't read, pick up a book, really pick up the book, not the audio book, pick up the book. We'll see how it goes. Your brain will go like, I'm done. I'm just going to go to sleep. Pick up the book, no TV, no Netflix, no nothing. Pick up the book, sleep seven hours, move every day, at least 10 minutes in the morning, right before you start your day and 10 minutes right after lunch, move every single day. It's critical. What's the other ones around? Um, well, maybe we should check ourselves and check our assumptions. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Some rapper said that. Check your assumptions. <laughs> I love you. Sorrel loves you more. Have a phenomenal weekend. Bye-bye. Have a great weekend. One love, See guys. you One love. Day. Peace, love you day. Peace, peace, peace. One love, guys. Love, guys. Love, Bye-bye. Have a beautiful weekend. Have a beautiful weekend, everybody. Bye, Carmen.